Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Lexi Smith. I'm the Fiction Category Manager here at Barnes & Noble. And joining me today is Jenna Siri, the Associate Producer of the Port Over Podcast. We are absolutely thrilled to be in conversation with Pulitzer Prize and National Book Award winning author Louise Erdrich, author of our October book club pick, The Mighty Red. If you sent questions in via the Eventbrite, Jenna and I have them, and you can also submit questions via the Q&A module, which Jenna and I will be moderating. As a reminder, this is a conversation with spoilers. We can talk about everything that happens in this book. So if you haven't finished it, you can always come back later. This will be posted on the Barnes & Noble YouTube channel. So now that all of the housekeeping is out of the way, let's start talking about the book. Louise, this isn't the first time you've written about this part of the country, about farming, and about this community in particular. What brought you back to these people, this location, this topic? I wanted to know a lot for, my, for myself. First of all, I have to always start a book needing to know something. And I wanted to know what had happened during the last 30 years. I mean, I could, re I, I started, my first job was hoeing sugar beets. But the, the whole sugar beet industry was pretty much undeveloped. So I wanted to find out what had happened since that time. I have to say, this book as someone who used to live in the Red River Valley themselves, yeah. I was immediately transported back to my time living there. There is such a tactile essence in this book. I mean, even down to the smell of sugar beets, which is like a very distinct and like sense memory. <laughs> <laughs> Not always the best one. <laughs> Not always, but it's like no other smell, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I think when you you describe some of it in the book. And I think for people, many people who have never been to this area of the country or may never end up there, there is a, a real sense of the community and the world in this book. And I think that the Red River Valley and the Red River itself are characters themselves in this novel. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you create this world so vividly for us as readers. Well, first of all, I am back there all the time. The longest I've not been back has been during this book tour that I took last month, and that seemed forever. Uh, my mother, my brother, my sister, my aunts and uncles, cousins, everybody lives in or near the Red River Valley or over in the Turtle Mountains. So I go back all the time. I'm just two and a half hours away. And so I wanted to write about changes I noticed, and then not about people that I knew at all, but I wanted to write a love story, you know, something, some kind of, this love triangle developed out of this love story, and I wanted to write about someone who drove a beat truck, and, you know, there's all sorts of things I could say I wanted to write about, and I just kept putting them into the book. I think that love and relationships are such a key part of this book. Um, one of the things I loved most about it was the relationships between mothers and their children, um, particularly Crystal and Kismet and Winnie and Gary in particular. Both of these mothers love their children fiercely, but in such different ways. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about what it was like to write those two mother-child pairs. Thanks, Lexi. And, and thank you, Jennifer, asking that question. I want to ask you some questions, too. Like, where did you live in the Red River Valley? I should have asked you while we were talking, but um, uh, let me answer the question about mothers and daughters. Of course, I have four daughters and have lived through more um, teen years than that accounts for <laughs> a lot of teen years with with chill, with young people and I as it turns out I really loved being the mother of teenagers it's challenging sometimes but it's exciting to watch what choices and ha what happens and to try and be 
more of a guide than um, it, try not to shut down and it, it be be scared all the time because it's it's scary too. You know, for both of those mothers, they're afraid for their children, and I was legitimately afraid a lot of the time because I would see choices that were just could lead down some paths that I was afraid would be harmful. But they all are such good people, you know. My daughter, I mean, my daughters, but the the people in the book, I didn't start out knowing how I would come to like everyone so well. For instance, Gary, I didn't I didn't want to I was having trouble writing him. But then he he became one of my favorites because um, his inner life was in such tumult. It was so, or is it tumult? It was so tumultuous and it was so painful. So once you start, you know, once you start writing a character's inner life, it's, it's really difficult to not have sympathy. And I always have sympathy for my characters. I love that. I love the way that you're able to sort of imbue so much life into characters that maybe if I just read a description of them, I would say, oh, that's not someone that I can relate to. That's not someone that I would feel connected to. And yet reading them, you have this moment of, oh, I do get it. And to answer, I lived in Moorhead, Minnesota for you many years. Did? Oh, I, I went to college did. there. Oh, I did too. I went to, I, I went to, College in Moorhead right after I got out of college. I wanted a teaching certificate. I never got it, but <laughs> that's what I was looking for. Yeah. But I think that your characters as well, the way that they, the way you show so many different aspects of love in this mm -hmm. book, from healthy to questionable to through ups and downs it really is a love story on so many levels not just the, the ones that we may see right away on the page mm. yeah i i think the parents have their love stories everybody uh in the book really has something going on i mean i liked icor and bev's love story a lot the the way they were together really always touched me and the struggle that Winnie and Diz, Gary's parents had was pretty familiar. And then of course, Crystal and Martin, <laughs> they're, they're mad. Uh, their ending really surprised me. I, I hadn't looked, I hadn't looked at the ending. I didn't know how I was going to end the book. So I surprised myself a lot when I came to the to the ending of the book. One of my favorite love stories in this book is between K Kismet and Crystal. Their, their mother-daughter relationship is both truly unique, but also very relatable. Um, the scene between the two of them when Kismet first tells Crystal that Gary proposed, I felt like they were walking this very specific tightrope that, you know, so many mothers and daughters, mothers and sons, fathers and sons, fathers and daughters walk mm -hmm. where, you know, the child is maybe seeking some advice from the parent, but the parent has to be very careful in how they give that advice. And in this specific instance, it didn't go as planned. Um, and I, I'd love to hear a bit more about how you developed Kismet and Crystal's relationship. Even even across the book, I feel like it changes and it's just so rich and wonderful. Yeah, that, um, that sort of dance between a teenager and their parent is so resonant for me because there's been so many different aspects to it for my for me and um i i know that that line that's you keep trying not to throw the other person into a um into in, into a um place of resistance to you you want to keep that 
those commun that communication open, right? You want to keep it open, but you don't want to also be just a pushover. And it's really hard to do. It's it it's um it's not always going to work. But I think if the trust is there, that's when you can expect to find some very special understandings between parents and and children and young people. So it's a, it's about it's about forming a basis of trust, I think. And they have that. And they have, but they also have, they fight, you know, they fight over, over her clothing sometimes or what have you. But they do have this trust and this comfort. Kismet seeks comfort from her mother a lot. Um, and you don't see that as much with Gary, but you know that his mother is really important to him as well. And Hugo, he is important to his mother and father. And Hugo really, was really fun to write. <laughs> he was, I feel like he maybe was the character closest to me in some ways. Um, this person who just loved with their whole being, but also had this kind of, view of themselves as being heroic, you know, like the heroic nerd. <laughs> yeah. I think Hugo was very fun to read for all of us. Oh, good. He, he brought in so many elements of the story that I wasn't expecting. In fact, there were a lot of elements in this story that I wasn't quite expecting. You touch on a lot of different things from aliens and astral projection to the art of book selling ghosts herbicides and the oil fields just to name like a few a few yeah and then deep time is also in there so we get some deep time and i love all of these things as i read a book i love to feel like i can go down rabbit holes as i read and like have these thoughts that are bigger than just what's happening on the page but I wonder how you sort of encounter these things as you write. Are these things that you're, you know, reading in the news? Are they from your personal life? Or is it just things that you're curious about and want to know more? So you add it in? Well, I am curious about those things, but there's a lot that I left out. I love there's hu a huge other book that I had to take out because I had so many um things I wanted to say and I I feel like every time you go into something that isn't directly hinged on a character or a plot, it's some other, something from the world that you can tell that the, the writer just really wants to communicate about this, right? So it's very detailed. Um, I have to earn that by having the characters do something before and something after that bring the writer back. So I couldn't put in everything because I had to be judicious about what I would use so that people would read what I had in there, you know, and enjoy it. And I also have to make it enjoyable. I can't just make it in, you know, um, it's not an op-ed or whatever. It's, it's fiction. And so I, I, I had to build that I had to feel that tension with the reader too, that feeling that you want to know what's going to happen. So I'm gonna read about deep time. Okay, you know, but I want to know what happens after deep time. I think another aspect that so many people that I talked to about this book loved, and I think people in the chat as well, we've got some questions even for, about it, is yeah. the inclusion of the bank robberies. Ah. These, <laughs> they, I think they were very, they were some of my favorite parts of the book because I just couldn't wait to see what Martin was going to do next. And like the way his brain worked was so interesting to follow along with. So I wonder if that was sort of in the same vein of those other things as you were writing. It was, I need to amuse myself too while I'm writing a book. I mean, I just can't write things that 
don't bring me um, some kind of uh, electricity or something. It has to be for, it's for me too. And these were also for my father who um, died in 2020, but he also was somebody who, uh, he just loved bank robberies. <laughs> I don't know how it is that he collected so many, but there's so many that weren't in there that, you know, that I could have put in and that were so, so wacky, so ridiculous. So um, all, you know, messed up, but he liked bank robberies. And that's why they're there. And I'm glad you like them. Because also this is set, we should say, in 2008, which I really set it in 2008. I mean, that's the real question in some ways. Because I don't feel as though our country has ever really dealt with the fallout from 2008. Um, I, f I feel like there was so much that there was so much loss that people lost homes, people lost jobs, things hollowed out in such a big way. And that was n never really addressed. It was, we never really came back from that time enough. It was 2008, 2009 into, into the present, really, uh, because the, the pandemic happened. But, you know, I always imagine what if the government had recompensed people who lost their homes at the, at the rate that um, businesses were compensated during the pandemic, for instance. A lot of good things happened for people. They, they were able to keep businesses. I was, we were able to keep the bookstore. And um, I think things would have been different. One of the other things that was really interesting to me in, in the book was that, um, you know, both climate change and big agriculture are also part of the fabric of loss in these people's lives. Um, you know, Winnie's family lost their farm and it went on to become part of a larger farm. Um, you know, the impact of the, the part about the high schoolers putting out sandbags for the river. Um, I loved the way that that the way you wrote it, that th this is just, it, it's just part of people's day-to-day -day life. Um, and I love to know more about how you did that. Did you do research um, and why that's important to this particular story? Well, a lot of it is growing up um, in the Red River Valley. I mean, I um, put sandbagging was a normal part of of uh, spring and flooding is a normal part of spring um, and the river is sometimes very dangerous and sometimes it's not so dangerous but it's also it's it's always a force and it always has to be reckoned with um, it's now one of the most engineered rivers certainly in the country because of those floods. Um, but that's how I, so it's, and then some is, some is researched. I mean, I, I still want to know more. I'm still want to, I still want to know more about sugar bee farming and how I'm, it's so complicated. It's so much more complicated than just putting the seeds in and watching them grow. I mean, you, you know, farmers are so, have to be so, incredibly smart to do this job to make all these decisions about when to uh, rotate your crops what sequence do you rotate your crops in you know what do you need for each crop and most farmers use um, chemicals very judiciously I mean there was somebody spraying something in the beginning of this um, 
I have never seen anyone personally spraying a field like that because they're very people are very worried. They people do not want to have that on their clothes or inhale. So usually, um, and Jenna's kind of nodding. Uh, usually, you people are in a cab with a uh, with the sprayers coming out to the sides when using a chemical on their fields or fertilizer, so as not to come into contact. But also. People want to use the least amount possible. It's very expensive. And people have, and farmers really have to, um, you know, go down to the penny with what they um, are going to use because of the margins and because of the uncertainty of what the crops will bring in many cases. Does that answer your question? <laughs> so, yeah, I think that it's part of the farming culture of the town. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I... I, I guess your question was, what? how do I find out about these things? What was the research you did? I'm so curious. Yeah, oh, I did. Um, so I, I, um, well, I would go home and I would read the newspapers, you know, and I listened to the for farm reports and um, uh, uh, subscribed to magazines. And um, I know farmers and would talk to them about, what they were doing and I was in touch with some weed control experts in um at North Dakota State University so all that sort of thing and then I just like reading about uh the geological basis for the Red River and and things like that I mean I just love reading about this and the I always love reading about the past and what it was like before it was so mechanized and uh, so farmed, so deeply farmed. I think there's so much that goes into these stories and there is sort of a, a like larger piece that comes up in your work so often about our connection to nature and the way that we interact with the world around us and how it affects us um, back just as much as we put in. And I think we see that so much with these characters. Like you said, the river is a force and you see that not only in the farming, but also in sort of the the accident with Gary and, and his teammates. And there is sort of this heaviness that comes with it. And yet there are so many other moments where, you know, there is life given as well, the Vesper flight that Kismet's able to right, see right. and the the sort of swings in the other direction as well. And I think your work does that so well, brings us into the heavier and allows us to sit with that, but still brings us back to the light and the the hope as well. Um, when you're working with texts like this, is it a conscious effort to sort of go into that tone and to shape it, or is the story just there and it takes you where it needs to go? Well, both, both. I, I... I wanted to make this a story that would bring people in, you know, that, that people would want to, to want to pass to their friends. You know, I, I didn't think that being polemical about this was going to help at all, but I did want people to think about, for instance, one, uh, one very simple thing, the cost of sugar, like what is the real cost in people's lives? So I wanted to, to get that across, and um, but I also wanted just to get people to enjoy, enjoy a reading experience. I think that's important. I think a lot too. I'm seeing this in the chat and in the questions. A lot of. Uh, love for the structure of this book as well. And I think that lends very oh. much into the way that we are drawn in, into these vignettes, into these these glimpses in time. And I know that you've done this in, in your work in the past, sort of these titled individual sections. And I think um, it just gives us such a, a propulsion through the story. So I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about choosing to write in this way and how it shapes your, the storytelling. You know, I pared back a lot of the book and I did it because I felt that I had written a lot of 
the backstories of every character, sort of more for myself. So there, there was a lot of description that got paired back and I wanted to keep it tighter. So then I, I felt like I was writing more of an episodic novel after that and that it was more enjoyable to write in these chunks of, of um, action and description and that I would only take what I really enjoyed reading and what didn't. I can always tell when something, or I hope I can always tell, that's the question for a reader. Are you indulging yourself or do you want to indulge your reader? You know, it's a question that I think writers are always asking themselves. Um, and I took out what began to feel if I would feel a bit of tedium and re repetition, I would take it out. And you have to be very tough with your, I had to be very tough with myself. I think it helped in this book. Um, and I think it, it made it more fun to read. I enjoyed reading it more when I had to read it over and over and many times to get it out. So maybe I took too much out, but I don't think it harmed the book. So and I keep looking at the back behind you. I keep looking at the cover because I love it so much. My daughter is uh, an artist and she does all the covers for my books. So that makes it just a pleasure to have a book out as a physical object. And I, I like the way it began to look as I put the pieces under titles. The other thing is I love titles. I love making titles. So I have lists of titles. Whenever I whenever I have a book, I I usually um I usually write to the title. In this case, I changed the title quite late into the the writing. But I love titles. So I got to use a lot of titles. And it was really fun. Will you tell us what that first original title was, or is that a secret? Oh no, sure. I'll tell you it was Crystal. And it was because I, when I started it, I thought I would be writing about the 2011 um, lockout by Crystal Sugar and how it impacted people who were working there. Um, they lost a lot in terms of their insurance and their benefits and wages. You know, it would, and and it was a really tough strike, a really tough lockout so I wanted to write about that at first but then <clears throat> and there was a um, person named Crystal but then I started writing something else entirely and I enjoyed writing it more so I kept with that one and it became about people it became more about a, a number of people living along the river and so it turned into the mighty red. We're very glad that it did turn into the mighty red because it's such a wonderful read. I'm so um, glad. One of the the things that I also really liked about the book is that there are these sort of almost mystical moments that happen in the book. You know, at the beginning when Crystal is driving and she sees the mountain lion and her headlights and sort of interprets that as a sign. Gary has these visions of Jordan. The moment with the Vesper, Vesper flight almost felt very spiritual. And mm -hmm. I'd love to know like how this sort of mystic spiritual element, how that came to be in this novel. Well, I think, well, Jenna, you can, I think anyone who, who lives for a while or grows up in that landscape, which is, mostly sky. I mean, the sky is what's, you're looking at the ground, but it's the sky that really keeps changing and showing up with, I don't think I put enough of the sky in. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's a very spiritual experience to exist in that, that world. Um, and I, I, I include the natural world and spirituality, of course. And so I um, I felt that they were natural occurrences in the book, that 
you know, you look at angel, you look at uh, cloud formations as they build on the horizon and you think of the grandeur of creation and it's not too difficult to go from there to the idea of angels and the the existence of some some creator of some ma- of the magnitude of creation you know the magnitude of what you're seeing is so startling and a lot of people will find themselves in that landscape and feel either awed or bored or uncomfortable um and i uh i miss it when i am not there i miss the 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 breadth and length and the the huge expanse of the sky it's it's where i feel i feel that that's a very spiritual landscape there is nothing quite like it i will say i mean i've yeah. never been so, like the the flatness of it you know to be like on a small hill and feel like you're on a mountain because everything <laughs> else around you is is so flat and also the winter there which is unlike anything i think most people have ever experienced with the wind and the cold i even miss that at this point yeah i mean you know we would go skiing my father was like love to ski and sometimes we would go to a hill that was probably it was called old baldy and it was like 200 feet high it was in a you know about 30 miles away but a lot of the time we would um go ditch skiing so we he would hitch a rope to the back bumper of the car and we'd get our skis on and he would drive along the roads and it was just totally flat you know that the snow filled up any of the dishes so you were just we were just bumping along on it's like water skiing only you're on snow um yeah, so <laughs> it's like nowhere else, really. It's a very a particular experience. And I think there's also a, a particular kind of person that lives there and stays there and puts themselves back into those communities as mm-hmm. well. And your books often offer us this sort of tapestry of characters, even characters we only see in, in small bits here and there you feel like you know them and you're like, I know where you fit in this, this bigger picture. I think of like Jennifer in the book and she maybe doesn't have as much time on the page. And yet I loved every moment that we got to spend with her. And I love in all of your work that there are just so many characters for us to love. And I, I wonder how all these voices kind of come into your head and if they all hang out there a lot. And if you, uh, you miss them once you finish these books. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, Jennifer wears a lot of sharp things like the scimitar in her hair and her fingernails, her, yeah, everything is just very sharp about her. And I sort of miss her. I don't really know anyone like her. So it she captivated me. Um, sometimes I bring back characters. I didn't bring anyone back from The Beat Queen, which was the first book that I wrote about this particular part of the world. But um, you just never know. I mean, there was a whole, uh, there was a large part of the book about um, Crystal's grandmother, Happy. And I didn't put it in because I didn't know where it was going. But Who knows? Maybe somebody will come back. I would absolutely love to read a book about Happy. She was fascinating. (laughs) Um, And, you know, in our Q&A module, uh, one of our uh, book club readers is curious about where the inspiration for these characters come from. Like you have so many characters. How, how How does each one of them come to you? Oh, well, I'm always... I guess as a writer, um, you're always writing on in some way. 
where you are open. You have to open yourself to whatever reminds you of someone and jot things down. I mean, they're all in notebooks that I keep. I keep, um, I write by hand and then I have those notebooks and then I have notebooks that are just details about different characters. And it's not like I follow someone around and write down everything they do at all. I, it's more as it's more that I um, have met a lot of different people in my life and I can call up a lot of um interesting pieces of you know I've, I've been around a lot of different places in the world and the way people act is is sometimes very similar to somewhere far away i don't know i just i'm inspired by everything around me i that's the only way i can really say it i just keep an open mind One of the themes in the book I also really liked was that the women in this community, for the most part, are are really capable and they're sort of the ones who are ultimately taking care of things. You know, Crystal is the one who's left to deal with the mess that Martin left behind when he stole the church funds right, and right. Kismet immediately begins caring for all of the members of the Geist family. And I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that dynamic and how it plays out in the book about how people take care of one another. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's really something that you see all, all through uh, a small community. There aren't a lot of, um, I mean, people certainly work as medics and people work driving an ambulance or people work in that way. But a lot of the time it's, your neighbor who comes and bails you out when when you've got a you know your your backyard is flooded or when you know when you need um some shoveling or something like that so i just um i do see that all the time even when i'm just home i see people are willing to and, and other family members willing to to help each help one another um and i think it i think it all it also happens anywhere it's not just a small town i mean i live in a city and people are always always helping out i really believe in the power of of community with other people I own a bookstore, and my daughter is uh, it, it is one of the managers. And there's a wonderful manager who seems to gather community around her. You know, she's she just has this uh, this pragmatic sense of what what is needed at the store. So there's. She's someone who I see bringing people into the community all the time. My my daughter and the uh, the manager, Nadine. I mean, what a everybody in the bookstore really is like that. Um, and books make a community in so many ways. It's why I started the store. I missed just having those conversations about books. And when I started it, there weren't a lot of book clubs but I love bookstores and I thought and bookstores were disappearing at the time so I thought it would be it would be wonderful to to be in that community and to stay in the community I love the I love the book community it's it's so important to me and it's almost I can see that it's almost everything for a lot of people who come into the store you know, um, people come from all over just to be in a small bookstore and to be to be in any bookstore, every bookstore. I mean, I, Barnes and Noble is huge, but it's also intimate because it's also it's always about the books and about the people. 
and it's where um it's where people come to sit one of my favorite people um used to come down from canada just to sit in the minneapolis barnes and noble he wasn't really into um my our bookstore because it was too small and there was too many people around but the barnes and noble had nooks and crannies and and, and it was big enough so that people would leave him alone <laughs> so every bookstore has its own uh magnetism and there was a bookstore in my hometown that was much like bev's bookery in this store and i really took a lot of inspiration from what seemed to me like a lot of courage to start a little bookstore in a small town and just hang in there with it. It's hard. I absolutely loved the scene in Bev's bookery when <laughs> Gary comes in looking for a, you know, a book about how to please a woman and yeah. Hugo has this internal battle of <laughs> You know, what do I do as a bookseller versus what do I do as a person who's in love with this woman? And um, as a bookseller, I was very touched that the bookseller side of Hugo won out. It was such a wonderful detail about his character. Yes, I feel as though there is a certain, like he had this code of the bookseller really in his heart, you know. Um, and I see that in people in that in who who are in bookstores and who who want in libraries who want so much they have a certain honor to them like i will honor your request whether i agree with it or not whether i like this book or not i will honor your request because this it's most important to get this book into your hands so that you can read it and that's what hugo does to his own detriment and then he, well, it goes on, but but we see that Hugo has indeed felt that he um, betrayed his his um, own possessiveness and love for the code of the bookseller. The real question is, would you hire Hugo at Birchbark? <laughs> oh, without a hesit, not a moment of hesitation. I would love to hire Hugo. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, he is very strong. His code is good. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're getting close to the end of our time here together, even though we've had such I a... I like it, yeah. I know. it. I think we could all talk forever about this book and about all of these wonderful characters, but I think Lexi has a question to sort of sum us up as we head out. The okay. Question I love to ask every author, um, you know, is what is it that you want readers to take away from the Mighty Red? Well, that's that's a question that can be answered differently for every reader. I want every reader to take something away, and I don't care what it is. Something from the book, either you remember the book or it gave you a feeling. You know, may, maybe it gave you a feeling or a sensation that I really love, which is I was immersed. I, I'd like that more than anything else. For a reader to be immersed in a book is the most important thing for me. I don't want to change people's minds. I don't want to, you know, I don't want any... Um, Trans it doesn't have to transform you. It doesn't have to do anything, but just give you a sensation that you were in a different world and you were immersed in it. That's what I'd like. I think that you effectively did that with The Mighty Red. Uh, I will be thinking about this book for many years to come. Thank Louise, you. thank you so much for joining us today. This was such a pleasure. And thank you to all of the virtual book club attendees for being here. We're so grateful that you want to join us for these. Thank Please. you for joining in. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for your questions. And thank you all for being part of the book community. Please join us next month for a conversation about our November book club pick, and we look forward to seeing you soon.
Thank you all so much. Have a great, wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Lexi. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Louise. Thank you.